This week's The Rockman Experience is brought to you by the Jacksonville Free Press newspaper, bringing you quality urban news for more than 30 years. PMP Nutrition and Supplements. Want your summer body? Go to pmpnutrition.com. They'll get you exactly where you need to be. And Edward Waters College, Florida's destination education institution for more than 150 years. Emerging eminence. And now, one of the hottest podcasts in the country, it is The Rockman Experience. Just like on the earth, through death comes life. There is something in the atmosphere of Edward Waters College. What about vaping and the effects on the lungs? It was a symbol of we can. The Rockman was a man of the city, you hear me? You're inside the Rockman Experience. It's the Rockman Experience. The Rockman Experience. The knowledge that he dropping most is missing make you curious. And we can't mess this up cause you know he gonna be furious. He bring the news to you cause it's the truth ain't no stopping it. Say you didn't know where here's the proof coming from. Rockman Johnson ain't no straight out of Compton. Duval County with that way that we rocking. Now you tuned in to the Rockman Experience. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Rockman Experience. I'm Rockman Johnson. As always, thank you so much for joining me. And unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, because things are happening, you're joining me from my home office. Uh, I'm not able to be in the studio at Everett Waters College or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, Because just hours ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has issued a stay at home order. And then earlier, which takes place actually on a Thursday, Thursday night into Friday, uh, here in Florida, where I live. And then of course, the governor or the mayor of the city I live in, Lenny Curry, has also, also issued a stay at home order. So the best thing we can do to slow the curve, uh, and to, to flatten the curve of what's happening with COVID-19 is to stay at home. As you guys know, we're in a worldwide pandemic. Um, the, the coronavirus uh, that started in Wuhan, China, uh, in the Hubei province, has escalated to thousands and thousands of death, deaths and hundreds of thousands of diagnoses around the world. Uh, The World Health Organization, as well as the Center for Disease Control, has said that this thing will get worse around the world before it gets better. But tonight, I've been trying to get two political operatives in Florida in the hot seat in the Rockland experience for quite some time. And it's sad that it's taken a worldwide pandemic for it to happen. But I have two of the smartest guys I know politically Uh, as a part of this. So I hope you'll join me and do me a favor, share this broadcast. I'll be sharing it as well. But let me welcome first uh, the former vice chair of the Duval County Democratic Party. He is also a graduate of Terry Parker High School and uh, Florida A&M University. Please welcome to the Rockland Experience, Darren Mason. Darren, oh, you're also a former legislative assistant to uh, council member Joyce Morgan. So you've got Arlington all in your blood in Jacksonville. Can't wait to have this discussion with you. How are you, Darren? I'm doing great. And first, thank you, Rockman, for the opportunity. Uh, Seattle's good to see you, as always. Um, let's just talk. I mean, we've talked to you about- to it. We're, we're, we're friends, so we're just gonna have a good conversation. The other yeah. person that we have with us, and you brought it up, Seattle's Jackson. Seattle's a graduate of my alma mater, Jean Ribot Senior High School. And you know, uh, Dr. Bostic would have our hides if we say, Gene Rebolt. So, of course, Jean Rebolt Senior High School. Uh, Seattle has been a politi- political operative, has worked through um, field campaigns for campaigns innumerable, uh, and has done some great work and is also very passionate about urban education. So, welcome, Seattle Jackson. Hello, 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 hello. And as both of them said, uh, I'm excited to do a round table. Uh, you know, uh, literally, we have been trying for about a year uh, to get this uh, together. And as he said, yeah, technology has taken over our lives right now. So this is the only way. Um, so it, it makes perfect sense. So I'm ready, let's get it started. So tell me this, um, in this space that we're in, as we work through this, and we'll, we'll be able to take some questions uh, coming up. But my question for you is, I guess I wanna start with uh, Ron DeSantis, Florida governor. One of the things when I posted that DeSantis was issuing a stay-at-home order for Floridians. Um, I can't tell you how many comments I got from around the country for people that were saying, it's about time, should have been done, all of those things. Tell me what you think, and uh, you know, was it too late here in Florida? Uh, so, so I think that was, I guess that's coming toward me. I, I would personally say no. Um, a lot of times people look at the bigger picture. Um, when you're getting updates for uh, this COVID-19, 
you're getting updates periodically. You're getting them, you know, every at the top of the four o'clock hour, the top of the five o'clock hour, um, and then maybe at 9 a.m. Uh, for individuals like myself and even yourself and the governor's office, we're, we're following this hour by hour. So we're seeing things in a different lens. We're seeing the, pro the progression that, um, that we, the level or the thresholds that we need to be in. So um, I don't think we, we waited too long. I, I think we, once we know, we, once we knew what resources were available, we quickly implemented them. We, we're constantly changing up our plans, um, even down to the point of issuing um, orders for those checkpoints. We are doing those dr drastic measures to ensure that the citizens of Florida um, don't have to um, change their lives so drastically, um, you know, like the rest of the world, but they can still breathe, you know, and get through this. Because this is also a mental health issue um, because people are now, one, they're, you know, they're not working, but they're also just they're at home every day and at, at home with children for the most part. So um, I don't think it was too late. I think we did it right in time. Um, and I think this is also going to prove to the world that, listen, you know, if you would have jumped on it, you would have started this process early. Um, nothing is perfect. You know, you, you look at some of this, the internet systems for assistance, they're down, but we did not expect this. But I think that we have a good response. Um, and, um, you know, we are where we are right now. And, you know, Darren, as, as we look into it, I mean, I think a lot of the corporate community has really stepped up to the plate, like uh, AT&T and T-Mobile providing hotspots and others. Um, the community is really saying, you know, Seattle just brought it up about technology. We've got the community coming and saying, look, we need to make sure that kids are able to get to school. People are able to get to their jobs and telecommute. So I, I really think the business community has done an amazing job of stepping up, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, so that's the beauty of this type of work is that, um, a lot of things that people don't see behind the scenes, as Seattle mentioned, but the one thing that I do enjoy is when there is a time of crisis, how the community, and particularly here in Jacksonville, uh, we tend to come to uh, tend to come together and bring the community on um, what we do anyway behind the scenes into the forefront. So the communication with our school board. Um, with city council, the mayor's office, and our federal and state officials as well to ensure that our youth does not miss a beat. And I think that's just the main important uh, um, uh, point is that things still have flow um, uh, as normal as possible. Right. Let's talk too about, I mean, one of the other things I was a little passionate about is the fact that we've got cruise ships, um, you know, docked off the coast of our city uh, or our, our there are cruise ships docked in the port in our city but there are ships as well uh off of the coast of florida and there are two schools of people saying don't let them in let them stay out there and then there's another group saying well hey let them in they're people what do you guys say i mean that's a major political hot potato and right now governor DeSantis, the last i read was saying hey don't let them in because we're having a problem dealing with stuff we got already. What do you think? Yeah, so the first thing is that you got to make sure that you have the resources in place to adjust in uh, making that decision to ensure that the uh, citizens that are on for the land are taken care of and our infrastructure is in place with our health care, but also uh, understand that they are humans. Um, so that compassion side does come to play where you're like, well, um, what are we going to do? So if there's any option to send support on the water, I think it would be great. Uh, I haven't heard anything recent of what is going to happen, but I, I do respect the thought of the, I don't want to add fire to fire. So I can, can understand that. But of course, like you said, that sympathy side is definitely, um, should be top priority as well. I see one of the comments. Um, Tasha Hagen has said, um, she's watching live, and thank you so much, Tasha, for tuning in. She said, we've got too many problems already. And, and I, I guess one of the things that I was seeing and, and saying was, yeah, I do realize there's a whole lot of problems out there, but you've got people who are on this cruise ship who do not have coronavirus, who are not afflicted in it in any way, shape, or form, and there are dead bodies on this ship and, and, you know, hearts and minds go to those families who've lost loved ones that they can't bury at this time. 
but we are subjecting the people who are on the ship to having to stay there. And I guess my question is, what if it was your family member that was stuck? And, and that's a political issue that right now, the power's in the governor's hands to say yay or nay. Hmm. Yeah, so, that's a big one. It's a big one. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know, maybe, and I hear the legislature is talking about trying to come up with making some other recommendation to the governor, but at the end of the day, I don't think they can do anything, especially now the legislature's not even in session. Yeah, uh, I, you know, this is a, a tough situation because, um, as you said, you know, you think about it as, you know, what if it was your family, but then you, you as a governor, he's in a tough spot. You know, his job is to make sure all Floridians um, have a safe and um, prosperous quality of life. And, you know, with that comes th those health risks. So, you know, he has a choice to make um, right now. And then he is getting, you know, he has to think about it. You know, do I want to continue to get the resources quick and readily and be in favor with the president? Yeah. Um, or do I want to protect the citizens um, of uh, this, this great state? Um, because the president, you know, has reached out to him last night and again today and, you know, and told him that he supports the ship being docked here and whatever resources Florida would need to ensure that, you know, those people are, they remain on the ship or, you know, they, you know, we can make that into a hospital. You know, the president has offered those resources. So um, he's in a tough spot. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what his 1145 um, decision is going to be. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I, my prayers are with him because he, he really has worked so hard to keep this, uh, to stay safe and to keep us informed, but also to make sure that we have the resources we need to, to attack this disease. Absolutely, and it's a hard decision. It is hard. I mean, it's gut-wrenching, and I do not envy him. And you're right, that decision is supposed to come at 1140, I believe, tonight. Uh, the governor is going to make a decision that he's going to share with uh, those people on the cruise ship, families, and, of course, the state. So we'll be waiting with bated breath to hear that. Speaking of decisions that were made tonight, guys, this is just in earlier today. Um, as a part of the shutdown of Florida, um, I'm here, and, and to me, it's funny. So I'm going to step out of my journalistic hat a little bit and editorialize somewhat because the governor's office has issued a statewide shutdown order. Guess one of the places that's still allowed to be open. Guess which one it is. Anybody? Did y'all hear this? Is it one of the places? One of the places that's still allowed to operate even during the shutdown order. Um, uh, gun shops, golf courses. Mine was golf courses. Okay. Immediately, it said specifically golf courses, okay. and okay, gun shops. I did hear that was one. To one. I mean, why even have the shutdown if we're only going to shut down some stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, you know, I think the the problem is, you know, the the I, and, and again, you know this best. Uh, it was a communication issue. I think you know we they wanted to put out there, hey. Uh, they want to show the seriousness of it. We want to shut this down. But then, you know, on paper, it is, hey, we want to provide some very strict restrictions, but not to that level to where it's completely shut down. So I think the way they did this, um, they rolled it out. Um, you know, I'm not, I know they're probably stressed, so I'm not going to take away from our fellow friends in the media. Uh, <laughs> but I think the messaging was completely um, twisted, and especially... You, you know, three hours later, we just told the local uh, mayors, our commissioners, you know, we're leaving this in your hands. And then we come back around and um, we say, hey, it's a statewide stay at home order. So it's a lot of um, communication uh, and, and messaging issues going on within the governor's office. But, uh, you know, it's my hope that people listen and, and they have their own interpretation to it and, and take it seriously, because that's all they want people to do is take this seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Now we'll get back to COVID-19. Uh, obviously that's the, the biggest topic in news, but because I have you guys and this is a political round table, of course, I got to talk some politics. So we're going to get back to COVID. I'm watching the breaking news um, here. So if we need to break in on some stuff, people need to know since we are live, I'll make sure to let you know. But got to ask you guys, so we're still in the heat and in the throngs of a democratic primary where uh, Senator Joe, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Senator, um, and I almost said Joe Lieberman. Oh, my God. Did I, I, I took it back to when I was uh, involved in politics. I was running for the legislature back then. And Lieberman uh, was our nominee. But um, uh, our vice president, Joe Biden, 
and Senator Bernie Sanders are the two nominees for the Democratic Party that are vying against each other. Now, we know that it is almost mathematically impossible for Bernie Sanders to, in any way, shape, or form, secure the Democratic nomination. But he's still in the race. So question, have you guys, are you out politicking? You guys are both very involved in the party. Um, you're, you've both been, um, you've held positions, all those things. Where do you stand? What should he do? And what's going on here in Florida? Where will we, Florida, of course, we've already had our election and we've spoken as a state, as Democrats, we've said Joe Biden's our guy, overwhelmingly. But the Bernie bros are still saying, hey, wait a minute, we still got stuff to do. We got, we want our, plat we our stuff on the platform. Um, I mean, is, does this make us weaker? Is, is this a bad thing? And, and where do we go from here, guys? Well, <laughs> um, being on that side of supporting a candidate, because uh, I was definitely a, a Elizabeth Warren supporter. So I get that passion and I get that uh, desire to still want to see something going. Um, but once you're, once it's mathematically impossible to carry on, uh, you have to just come to that end of the road and just know when it's time to pack it up. <laughs> Uh, and so for me, I think that the longer that we have this two options, in a sense, on paper, it definitely is not going to help us long term. Um, I think we saw that before. And so, but I think that it's the responsibility of uh, the two candidates to kind of to uh, steer that messaging to become a one party uh, going, in, especially with this crisis that we have going on right now, we can't afford to be divided in any shape, way, or form. So Absolutely. I, I, I think it is time uh, because when you are running for any office, it's about the win. And it's about bringing, you know, the what all you have on the field. And once that time is over, um, you need to support the, the, the direction of the party, regardless if that's your candidate or not, initially. And so I think that it, it is drawing things out that's very unnecessary at this point. Ciadis? Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 one for Florida, um, you know, we, we saw the results of, of the race and, and I had, uh, at, at the very last minute, I did endorse um, former Vice President Joe Biden. Um, I, I think the, the this pandemic and where our country is, you know, there's so much uncertainty. Um, there's so much, um, you know, uh, conspiracies out here. And I think this is a time that, you know, that I, 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 me personally, my recommendation to men politically, I would like to see Bernie Sanders to go ahead and, you know, drop out and let's begin to unify this country. Let's begin to, to bring people together and let's let them know, like, listen, we're here for you. And because we're here for you, we're not going to even take you guys through this process of finishing this election, um, you know, because I know mathematically I can't win the nomination. Um, and I know, you know, I look at, the, I'm, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm looking at the polls, but this is an opportunity for, um, you know, us to just let's begin to bring that hope back that we had four years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, and that courage where, you know, we, 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 we truly believe let's bring, Let's bring that back. And we, if we start now, we can um, get people there. But there's a lot going on. You have the census, the stimulus packet, and you have this um, pandemic going on all at one time. All of those things are things that, um, that have grasped people's attention just a little bit, but not enough to make them say, I'm going to get out and vote no matter how long I stay in the line. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to add to that point. Um, sure. Because, uh, the Senator uh, Sanders did a great job of, of this far, but as you see in the recent uh, headlines and trending, uh, it's constantly every week there's an issue with a staffer or a statement of attacking a former candidate, um, a supporter of the Biden campaign to where it's just, un now, now it's no longer about the issues, it's no longer about the, the uh, policies, it's personal. And I think at this point, as the good leadership, you know, it, sh it, it should be about the, the people, the policies, and then the crisis that we're dealing with right now. And now it's just kind of has uh, steered from that uh, point of the conversation to where it's just becoming unnecessary. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments that we're getting now. One of the ones, by the way, thank you, Ms. Fletcher, uh, for your comment. She's on Facebook and Ms. Fletcher said uh, one of the reasons why Governor DeSantis did not um, go ahead and make the order because he was waiting on Trump to see what Trump wanted to do. And, uh, you know, we did see that the governor's office said they were trying to wait because they did not receive directives from the White House. So um, we do see that comment. Also, uh, Tasha said, who's also watching online, um, that uh, why, why let him drop out? Let him go on and see what he can do. Now, from my perspective as somebody that's been involved in politics for the majority of my life, as well as in journalism, the longer you have an opportunity to say something is the longer, the, the, the better chance that you have an opportunity of saying something wrong. Right. And if the opposite party, and this is just me speaking as a pundit here, if the opposite party is able to look back on the things that both Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are saying during these debates, they can then turn around and almost use it as ammunition against them in the general election in November. Um, so okay. it's, it's a detriment. What do you guys say to that? Yeah, and then being a candidate, party leader, and staffer, what you see is that when it becomes to uh, be prolonged like this, uh, you have to take, uh, take account of those people who work for you, who are believing in you, um, and the account of the direction of what they're doing. Most people, they, this is their livelihood. They, this is how they pay bills. And so if you're left with constant uncertainty of where you're going in those directions, um, your campaign uh, tend, to, tend to lose this value, the authenticity of running a presidential campaign. And so when you're not speaking and you're not rallying or giving daily briefings to engage your base, you are allowing uh, the opportunity for the conversation to steer into personal attacks. And that's what we're seeing right now. Um, yeah, it'd be great to have all the candidates the ability to go all the way through. <laughs> Even you know, Tulsi Gabbard, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> but at the end of the day, realistically, what is that going to do? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, so I understand that logic because a lot of, of my Bernie friends say, hey, we're going to go all the way through. But, but at the end of the day, what is that going to do? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got you. What's the any, you, Seattle's? Any, any addition to that? You said it best. You, you know, um, it, the longer you wait, you know, the, the more you're, um, you know, as I would, as my slow, don't give your enemy anything to work with. Uh, when, when you give your enemy something to work with, you are setting yourself up. You are writing your ticket to fail and you are casting a vote for your opponent. Yes. You know, that's not something you want to do. Uh, you know, you want to be strategic and you want to be smart. It's not always, all campaign plans are, you know, are not sketched in stone. So being smart about these things um, and being strategic, part of that is, you know, being the adult and, and being calculated. Hey, I'm not going to be the nominee. Let me go ahead and drop out. Now, one, because if I can make an opportunity, it could be an opportunity for me to be a, um, to rerun for my Senate seat. That's yeah. one. Or two, you know, this is an opportunity for me to, you know, raise additional funds for for A, B, C, or D. So, you know, oh, things for that can work out in his favor. But um, I think it's about humbling himself is what he needs to come to, um, need to have a personal conversation with himself about. Gotcha. So, uh, and guys, for there, there are a great deal of people that have joined. Thank you so much to everybody. Again, you're in the midst of the Rockman experience. We're doing it live. Uh, live today, and there's a, some great guests that we have coming on that we scheduled live. Of course, we are in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 Wuhan co coronavirus uh, worldwide pandemic, but uh, we still must make sure that information and knowledge gets out to the community. So I'm so thankful to have in the Rockland experience today, Darren Mason, former vice chair of Duval County Democratic Party, uh, as well as a uh, political operative and, and a legislative liaison for councilwoman, uh, councilwoman former Legislative Liaison to Councilwoman Joyce Morgan and Seattle Jackson, uh, graduate of Rebalt Senior High School, community leader and political operative in Florida. Thanks, guys. Just wanted to give people uh, the heads up. We are being joined by lots and lots of people. So thank you all for joining in and being a part of this show. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the legislative session. Uh, we are very close to having a few legislators on the show coming up uh, in, in a bit. So we're going to talk about some of the, the wins and losses. What do you think? Obviously, the Wuhan coronavirus 
uh, COVID-19, all of the names that it's called, Cora, uh, Cor Corona Rita, all the names that, that we've heard it called. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not saying it to downplay it, but we sometimes have to laugh to keep from crying. Right. It came right at the tail end of session. And uh, I saw that uh, many of the legislative leaders as they were coming back were having to be tested. I think there were some people that were diagnosed with COVID. But a uh, question for you there. Um, what do you think about the legislative session this year? Did you see some, some great things happening, wins, losses? What do you think? So, I mean, I, you know, I think this, this session was, um, was one that we haven't seen in a while. Um, a, lot of a lot of deals were, were made prior to uh, like a lot of the final votes. So you can see the direction of it. Um, some of the caucuses and, and their, um, their agendas, everybody was able to get something out of it, you know, and it was something in a big piece, something that can be rememberable. And, um, and for some of their legacies, as some of them are now termed out. So uh, the session this year was good. I'm very interested to see um, what's going to happen, what's going to take place with the education bill, which is the only thing that's still outstanding. And if everybody knows Governor DeSantis, um, everybody is, you know, he has said that he's going to let the budget sit there until they return a session and address his education bill. And what, you know, what basically that says is let's put more money into education. We um, the have, teachers pay would get teacher pay would go up. All those other things domino effect. You know, everybody down to uh, janitors will will now get um, a living uh, wage. Living wage. But if you think about it, you know, look where we are. We are now in a stage where parents are having to teach their kids. Parents are understanding the importance of teaching. So he's now going to have every right and every backing of every parent going forward because of this pandemic that we're in right now. And, you know, uh, I, I don't think it's gonna be an issue with getting this bill passed once if he calls an emergency session back, which, you know, he's gonna do because he wants this bill heard and he wants to pass. Even if it's not the entire amount, at least let's start somewhere. Darren? Yeah, so for me, uh, I definitely agree with that, uh, Mr. Jackson. For me, the most interesting uh, conversation in the uh, in session this year was the um, how I word this the conflict with the governor's office and the um, our commission for agriculture and uh, consumer services. Yes, upholding uh, resources funding, um, if not if. If her office uh, commissioner Nikki Free did not remove her photo off the gas station of uh, pumps, so if you don't know, um, wait a minute, I didn't know about that bill. So they're saying that her name can't, even though she is the commissioner of agriculture and consumer services. So if you've been to any sort of gas pump, you have seen the picture of Nikki of Free. Nikki Free. So to yeah. me, it's very interesting that that kind of took a lot of head, uh, head, headlines and conversations this session about the resources and health, and as well as the um, a lot of the services being removed from the energy office yeah. if the picture was not being removed. So, so that, that to me was a conversation that took up a, a lot um, that to me was very interesting. Mm. Um, about a picture. Which is so, like, there's so many other things that we need to be worried about. And, and Nikki, who is a great person, I consider her a friend. She came and spent some time with me in my classroom at Edward Waters College. I mean, she's, even before she was running, um, I know a lot of people took offense to her as the weeds are, because before becoming this commissioner, she was all about uh, cannabis, medicinal marijuana, allowing it, and even eventually, hopefully, allowing it to be recreational in Florida. But to think that we'd waste time on something like that, it's kind of crazy. Uh, not, not Mr. Not, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, Professor Johnson, and and, and Rotman, the the media. That sounds like an idea that you would have told her to do. Because if you, <laughs> think, I'm but, I mean, I mean, I'm in communication. But I mean, my goodness, come on. That sounds like an idea that you would recommend. I just think about. It. She is in a position that that really people never pay attention to. But we know she has a, a strong political future, and we know that we need to increase name recognition and face her. Facial recognition. So why not 
put your picture on something where everybody's going to see you every day. So that makes, and it looks as if you might be the governor, you know, because your mm -hmm. picture is up there. So that is a very smart move. Uh, it increased face, facial recognition for, again, for a position that we did not even know was something that, for people to pay attention to. No, and I'll, I'll tell you, Nikki was on my show before she became Commissioner Freed. Uh, and it was so funny. We were like, wait a minute, she's for we? Oh yeah, okay, done. But you know, especially the urban community, but it was deeper than that. And I do believe that, you know, medicinal marijuana gave her a claim to fame, but even with this, I mean, but why even bother it? Because I mean, right now, think about it, here in just Duval County, our tax collector, the name is on every tax collector's office. The mm -hmm. property appraiser, all of you know, the name is on the office. It even comes on the uh, stuff that we get at our homes, right? So what's the problem it's with not that? like it was a big picture. I mean, you really have to take your time to actually look at it. But just the fact that that was one of the yeah. top what Absolutely. five um, issues yeah. in our session this year was was, was kind of mind blowing. I want to be oh, go ahead, see Otis. Anything about session this year, and you know, I want to applaud. You know, not taking this from it, but she is the sponsor of the bill. Uh, State Representative Tracy Davis. Um, Early before the COVID-19, she proposed for the second year in a row a bill for uh, paid sick leave. Um, and if you see where we are today, those individuals, um, individuals you know, across the nation would be able to use their paid sick leave if it had passed. And so right now, everybody is wanting to go back and revisit that bill in an emergency session um, because the federal government, you know, at all the bills that they're they're reviewing right now, even the ones that they're going to vote on next week, is paid sick leave um, because this is how companies can literally pay people during this time. They yeah. can use paid sick leave, and you know I applaud her for 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 putting that bill out there two years in a row. And even for you know this time she was able to get an, um, a companion. You know uh, Senator um, Janet Atkins. Uh, you know she, version of it. So. Uh, you know, I applaud those efforts. We didn't know we were going to be here, but the fact that you even put it out there, um, this is a good first step for our state. And I think we're in a good position, even if we were to uh, have an emergency session so we can revisit this. And people and companies can, um, can, can get some funding to help them through, you know, this sick process or, you know, doing this so people can get paid while they're out. I want to pivot back to COVID-19. Uh, I have a note here, and, and unfortunately, um, uh, I, I want to read it verbatim because I, we got to kind of pivot back. And there's so many people that have been affected by the Wuhan, uh, the coronavirus. This one, um, this person, is, this is Tasha. And, and I happen to know Tasha. Being someone who has lost someone during this pandemic, the way they're handling it is horrible. I understand that they feel like they have to protect people. But for my brother, which, um, well, we'll go into that in a second. For, but for my brother to die alone, and we not know anything for hours until we got a call to finally say, we're sorry, we did everything we could is disheartening. My brother went to the hospital not feeling well. His stomach was hurting. He uh, just walked in to figure out what was going on. And now we're planning a memorial, a memorial in two weeks that no one will be able to attend uh, when they finally release his body. In fact, as of now, we have yet to receive his body all that we know is that he's dead. Um, this is the third. Now, Tarsha just happens to be my cousin, which makes her brother my cousin. Uh, this is the second relative of mine that has passed away uh, from the coronavirus in as many days. And what do you think about, and, I, and granted, I, as, a, as a member of the media, I, I'm still a journalist, regardless of whether I've done politics or any of that stuff. I'm by trade, by training at Edward Waters College, I'm a journalist. And in the questions that I've asked, people still don't know how the virus is deployed specifically. We do think we know. The World Health Organization, as I'm looking now, and CDC, or even revisiting, looking at telling us to just wear regular masks as we go outside, and if you remember at the beginning of this pandemic or when it was an epidemic, they were saying the masks won't help you. But you just heard my cousin's story about our family member, her brother. Do you think this thing is being handled the best it could? I, she asked this question and you know, I'm glad we're live because we can have this kind of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, 
let's say wave a magic wand, you are the, the leader. I won't say president or governor or whatever, but you're a leader. How will you or how would you may, maybe do things differently? Sorry to hit such a pivot, but I saw this in the comments mentioned and I thought it was important that we, that we talk about it. Cool. <laughs> um, that, first of all, I send my condolences to you, your family, uh, Robin and Tasha, definitely send my prayers to you. Uh, in this situation, uh, it's extremely tough when you are constantly learning. Um, many opportunities and positions, you kind of go in knowing what you, what, what your agenda will look like. And in this moment, we are all learning. And even with our officials, like I've been in many rooms uh, along with Seattle, but we're educating them and we're teaching them as well as we're learning ourselves. Um, but in the sense of communication, and not a way to be as compassionate as possible. Um, this is definitely a situation that is out of our control. Um, we can't control certain things, but we can control how we react to it. And so as far on as a reactive measure, I think that our communication with those families needs to be a lot better. I mean, those that information needs to be real time. It needs to be a way where there is bringing comfort. And that's something that I always advocate with any official that, that I work with, regardless if it's in the elected or pastoral, um, whatever, is that what is your compassion plan? And I think that's something that we need to roll out right now, I think. And that's a challenge that I would present to all leaders in all capacities is to create a compassion plan for these families who are dealing with something that they can't get answers about. And I think right now, that is the problem, is that families aren't getting answers across the board um, of just basic information um, and just basic comfort and sympathy. This is not just some, something that we can just get, get over with. And I think that's the communication which the God is saying as far as the media. It's just, hey, it's happening. These are the numbers. These are the facts. Deal with it. Yeah, and and you know, and and my condolences to uh, Tasha too. And you know, I pray that you all, um, you know, find some healing through this process, and especially with it being so difficult and, and new. Um, but you know, uh, in in everything we do, and you know, especially when you when you when you're in politics, or you know, just dealing with things in life in general, you know, there's always going to be areas of improvement. Um, this this whole thing is is new you know this pandemic is new um there was a lot of uncertainty um it's up to th these government officials and these leaders of these different entities whether it's the hospital you know the homeland security to figure out what other countries are doing what has worked um from the best thing. I mean, again this is new because so most times Whenever you, you you can strongly say this is work, it's because it was an experiment. You know, you, you were able to get to figure out what was your controllable things. And, you know, it happened a couple of times. Well, now, you know, we're, we're still in an experiment stage. We're trying to figure out what worked over there. So let me go out and try it because it had the best results. Not saying it's going to work for us. So a lot of this is new. A lot of this, um, you know, even down to, like I said earlier, the, the unemployment line. We did not expect to go from 21,000 um, unemployment um, applications for a month to go to 100,000 in a week. That's why the system, they're, they're having to hire 71 people start working there on Monday. Just, just to process. Yeah, just yeah. to process these things. So, you know, again, it's, it's a lot. It, this is a new thing. Nobody expected it. And now, if I want to, you know, you, you know, we, we're human, so we sometimes we want to point blame. I point blame at, at our congressional federal leaders because federal leaders, both the president and Congress and the Senate, all three of them were notified in a um, in early meetings about this. You know, even our I love my Democratic people, but we can say what we want to. But the Health Committee got the same briefing that Donald Trump got, and they did not act on it and they have just as much power as him. So to say that, hey, he made it a host, yes, he is the president, but you guys are our leaders too, so they should have reacted to this. So um, the, the governor, I think he's, he, I mean, again, he's, to me, 
I think he's doing a, a very good job handling this situation because some of the stuff is new. Again, there's always areas of improvement. Um, you know, Saturday, the media grilled him because he called the president Saturday morning and told the president he wants his materials right now since the law was in, in place. He'll send somebody up there. And everybody was like, well, you've been selfish. You know, there's other states that, you know, that, that's been in this game longer than you guys. You guys are just, you know, at your early peaks. And like he said, my job is the responsibility of the Floridian, Floridians. So, you know, if that's getting materials first, so that way we can easily um, attack this, you got to do what you got to do. You know, it, it's, it's taking some unconventional un um, um, actions uh, to make sure that we do everything we can so we can quickly return back to normal um, lives, at least to the best of our ability. I need some sense of normalcy. And let me say, Derek, Andrea, Gwendolyn, thank you so much for um, your uh, condolences and for the love for uh, Tarsha. I'll speak for Tarsha and for our family. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And, and Ernest, Ernest Copeland, my other cousin that passed away. Um, I am, you know, not that I'm not emotional, but I want to do my part in this way to have these conversations um, so that we can let their deaths and the deaths of all of the other people that have passed away or that are being afflicted with coronavirus now not be in vain. Speaking of which, um, let's talk about some of the things in the community. And by the way, guys, if you're just joining, uh, we'll be here just a bit longer. We are, uh, this is the Midst of the Rockman Experience uh, podcast and my first live social show. So thank you guys for helping me go back to my news roots and, and pioneer uh, doing this show. And I figure if Chris Cuomo, who our thoughts and prayers go to him, Chris is in his basement broadcasting live with the coronavirus, right? He is pushing through. So if Chris is doing his thing and his brother as governor of New York, uh, Governor Cuomo is doing his thing, then we can do our part as well. And speaking of doing our part, one of the things on a positive note, man, that I've seen is the community has stepped up in such an impressive way. Uh, I know um, I was watching, and I, I'm going to give credit where credit is due, uh, City Councilwoman Jacoby Pittman, Councilwoman uh, Brenda Priestley-Jackson, uh, Councilman, I know he wasn't there, and I'm so glad he's better, Sam Newby, I think was a part of it as well, but they did, or reached out with State Representative Kim Daniels, and they have been working with FarmShare, I believe. Yes. And they have fed, if I think the numbers are right, um, and I talked to Jacoby, uh, I believe 2,900, like, they had a, a pop it and pack it campaign. Is that the name of it? I don't know what it's called, but it's like... It's a pop-up pop drive-through. Okay, it's pop it and pack it. I don't know what it's called, but it's some campaign where you pop the trunk, they plop some fresh veggies in and go, and then you go. So no contact, no way of even um, contracting anything that could be out there but they're making sure, I think at last, they, they did it two Saturdays, maybe? And I want to say so they've serviced so far. Am I right, Ciatis? It was one Saturday, and that one Saturday, they uh, they did service over um, like 2,800 people. Yeah, like almost, I think the number was like 29, the, the, the specific was 29 something. So really good. Um, I know personally for me, I'm working with um, Florida Blue, University of Florida Health Extension Service, a bunch of local farmers, um, Anthony Brown, Angela Timbrook, um, uh, the team, uh, Natasha from, from University of Florida, we were able to partner with local farmers in Florida Blue. And I think so far we've done about a thousand pounds of food where we've done and ran it through the Shell Suite Center at Edward Waters College, uh, the Newtown Success Zone, uh, and we'll be working with Black Men Walking with Gabe Rogiers coming up. And so we've gotten, and, and the beauty is that we, and, and I was so happy to be a part of putting this thing together, we are making sure that regardless of the separation that we must keep, that we're taking care of the people who may not have. And one of the things I've done, like as a part of what I, and I'm, I'm saying as we can all do it, and I'm telling you this because I want to know what you see people doing in your communities. I know for me, as I went and helped put this thing together to get these bags out, I then went and was, were, I was delivering the bags to seniors who couldn't get out, um, senior citizens who were afraid, you know, coming to the door wrapped in seven plastic bags, because you know we will, um, because they wanted to make sure, and I say that jokingly, but they wanted to just make sure they were protected, and the, the information is so all over the place. They didn't know what was going on. 
So I went and delivered these, this food, left it on the porch and kept, kept rolling. And I think people are doing that all over. And sometimes people are doing who we don't even know about. They're just going to the grocery store and getting some stuff to help people. What are you seeing that people are doing? And maybe you can share some of the things that you know that people who need help can get it. Yeah, um, I, I, I know I saw uh, several individuals um, that, that just was, even early on, hey, if you need some tissue, you can co come by. Um, uh, uh, James, um, he's a soil and water gentleman. Um, Cook. James Cook. He, he did a very good job by going to the store and buying his supplies and, you know, and just providing them to those who couldn't afford them. And, you know, even Angie Nixon, she... Uh, Angie she Nixon, who's running for state representative. Yes, he was running for state representative. She, uh, she, she was giving out toilet tissue, hand sanitizer <clears throat> at her shop, and then that was in a community that we typically don't go in. You know, we were in the um, the A. Philip Randolph area, um, but then you know, today I was um, on you know several calls. Um, uh, Tamika Gaines Holly was uh, she's organizing um, because we you know we pretty much mandated seniors to be home anyone sixty five and older. So she's arranging a daily food for them and we're setting up that, that delivery process because Meals on Wheels can't handle this magnitude of people that need meals. So um, she's working through delivery options, you know, working with the local sheriff's office um, and, and not only doing Duval, she's doing Duval, Putnam and some, all of the surrounding counties. So I appreciate people, you know, doing these things and, 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 and acting quickly and, and figuring out the different you know coming up with those solutions because it's hard it, it is very hard during this time um especially for nonprofits you don't have if this was in, in your budget you know you really have to depend on um creative funding yeah. and um you know extreme measures to make sure that you know those who can't are still served and we'll get some of those addresses and leave them when we repost the show so those resources can be shared, like with Tamika or with Angie, so we can share them. Darren, anything to share? Yeah, so it's just uh, two things that I have uh, seen that's been uh, very uh, innovative is uh, three companies, uh, a, a local uh, paper product company. And so what they did was all their overstock, they created emergency packets. And um, with toilet tissue and hand sanitizer and just cleaning supplies as well. And they uh, have been literally delivering every day on the hour to anybody that needs it. And they're, all their manufacturers are in the U.S. So they've been able to get the stuff in and get it out, but also have been working with the um, nursing homes and senior facilities as well to ensure that those things get to them. Um, as soon as possible, um, as well as these other youth facilities as well, um, with the foster care homes um, and those other uh, public sectors organizations. So that local business right here from home has been able to produce and support so many different people. Um, but definitely also want to give a shout out to the Boys and Girls Club and to our school board, our school district. Uh, to ensuring that our kids um, that rely on uh, school lunch are getting meals every single day. And I think you know, they started the dinner program this week or they're starting next week. Um, so to me, no, I, I want to say it's going on now where if you yeah, go yeah. up, you can get okay. dinner. I know they're getting lunch. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I want to say again to the school board has been doing, I mean, they initially, it came out and they were only doing laptops for uh, the seniors to make sure they graduate. And now every kid in the county, those that can't afford it, have laptops. Uh, Comcast has stepped up to the plate to make sure that internet access is free. So I want to say this is a, and just, uh, we have got to put the word out and make sure that people know about these things that are happening. Uh, by the way, everybody that's watching, because um, we have just a bit more time before we wrap this show up, but I want to remind you that if you have comments or questions, these guys are two of the hottest political operatives in Florida. Uh, Darren Mason, for, former vice chair of the Duval County Democratic Party, and Seattis Jackson, um, a Democratic operative, uh, and actually just an operative politically around the state. Thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah, I want to say, Seattis is, I, I, I jokingly call you, and I think you jokingly sometimes use it, Seattis Pope. Like Olivia Pope, because when, when the scandal is there, you will find a way to fix it, my man. Um, 
I, do, I want to pause real quick and really, uh, uh, you know, shout out Duval County. And I think our governor shouted them out to the Duval County public school system. When this first came out and Duval County was on, um, uh, they were already on spring break and it was conversations, you know, um, and I, and I was sitting on those calls, you know, they were like, well, we could go virtual and, you know, Duval County stepped up and they already had a plan in place and they, it was, it was quick. And, um, I applaud them because they, you know, they, they've done such a good job. And even the fact of offering laptops, not all school districts are offering laptops because at the beginning of the year, when parents got those letters that says Title I or, you know, your supply list, they asked you to have access to, to a computer at home. Um, so I applaud Duval County for doing these things and, and, and doing them quickly. And, you know, I just tell people to be patient, you, you know, um, nothing, this is all new. You know, if, if you, if this was something um, that was old, you know, it, we will be prepared, but this is new. So parents, you know, and, and community, let's be patient because they really, are trying to work these kinks out. This is the first even time trying, Ciadis, I will tell you, I have not seen these guys, specifically Greg Bostic over at Reball, and, and just everybody, Evan Daniels and, and Steve Richardson. I mean, all these guys, these principals and these ladies are braving the rappers. Did you see the, 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 the caravan of teachers that were like, we can't get out the car, but we're going to ride through the neighborhood and blow our horns and let you know we're, here, we're in this with you. Uh, this and it's not happening. I talked to some educators in both Alabama and Georgia, and I will tell you, right now the school system is shut down, and they have no idea what to do. Yeah, and, uh, and if you think about it, you know, in this virtual, most people are like, "Oh, you know, teachers." I've saw comments, and I'm and I made a very aggressive post um, that you know went a little viral, and and I, and I stand by my post. Teachers went from you know nine to five or whatever those hours are. Now these kids have access to them twenty four hours a day. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, while, you were, while you were working these kinks out, and my niece is in was in a chatting with her um, her teacher, and I was like, "We, I'm not gonna have that in this house. You know, I'm not gonna allow you guys to think you can just chat with your teacher just because you know you want to chat. No, we gotta let, let them have a life too." I get it, but it will, it will not happen. Yeah, yeah. and then we need to appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, they're doing a great job. You've been a first time parent of a student from the Duval County uh, School. Because there, you have three kids. Two. <laughs> okay. How is that? How is it? How are you adjusted being daddy homeschool teacher now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, very interesting. Not in a million years would I would think that this <laughs> in the first year. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sending our son to kindergarten, but even with him, I mean, it was tough. We had to have these tough conversations. We had to explain um, what happened, what's going on, why he can't go back to see his teacher, go back to see his friends. He's worrying about his supplies. I still got my favorite pencil in my cubby. You know, just things like that where you can't explain. You know, you can only do the best that you can. But I can say that this. School district has done a phenomenal job. I mean, even with uh, just a, him just seeing her face every day, it just lights them up. And then just even uh, just the communication. I mean, yes, there's a lot of technical difficulties because it was sometimes I was getting real frustrated with him and her, um, and just how the system just was. But the fact that there was something in place. I have friends who across the state is just like, we ain't doing nothing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have quick it was different. Our district was able to turn it around. Gotcha. And if anybody watching live right now, we're, we're about to get to a place where we're going to wrap things up. But uh, Khadijah, thank you so much for watching. Imani, who is watching from another county but used to live here in Duval, thank you. I know Orange County is going through the same thing. So we appreciate you down there, Imani, and uh, for passing the word. And she wanted to send uh, her thanks to you guys for sharing your knowledge. Uh, uh, Tammy, uh, I appreciate you tuning in. And also Khadijah has said that Hanan Hamid Farquan, uh, Hamid Farquan is the owner of Three's Company. If you need it, whatever, they got it. So mm -hmm. we'll make sure that we leave the contact for Three's Company up mm -hmm. so we'll that it. you can be a part mm -hmm. of what's going on. It's, that's serious. All right, we really didn't get a chance to handicap many of the races. And I guess one of the biggest races, and, and by the way, if you guys have comments that are tuning in now or just watching, you're in the midst of the Rockland Experience uh, podcast and show. This is our first live show with Ciadis Jackson and of course, Darren Mason, 
And uh, I want to jump into it and see, Otis, I see you smiling there because you know I'm going to go. Let's go with the big race from the top. Congressional race. Uh, the big dog is in the house. Uh, of course, uh, that's the, the, I guess, biggest political seat in North Florida. Uh, Al Lawson is currently the member of Congress. And the reason I bring it up is you talked about the federal government getting briefed about this thing. Well, um, he is being challenged by a young upstart pharmacist from uh, here in Jacksonville. Young, and I say upstart because this is his first time in politics, but he's going for the big thing. How, can you handicap that race? Al, Al Chester is challenging Congressman Al Lawson. And you know, I want to do. I do want to say that um, they have a, a third opponent. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, Miss uh, Lashonda L. J. Holloway. Holloway. Yep. Yep. And I was going to bring her up because oh. the reason I didn't bring her up first because L. J. Ran before, mm -hmm. and I was going to put that in that L. J.'s the numbers um, showed that she actually had a significant number of votes. So L. J. Ran. I want to say in the past twice. And I was gonna bring her up at the end to say she ran twice and actually had a significant, could, could this be the time that she moves forward? Um, you have these guys who both have, and the reason I bring them two up separately from LJ, because they have a Tallahassee connection. Both mm -hmm. Chester and Lawson, both are big time fam you folk. How can we handicap it? Oh, so, um... This is, is definitely has become a race to watch. Um, initially, it was like a long shot um, conversation. Uh, and so with all three candidates, I have a relationship with them, have worked with them all individually. Um, I worked on Congress Lawson's 2016, no, 18, she, that seems so long ago. Uh, You're getting old, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, race. Dr. Chester's great friend, my sitting a brother, I love him and his family. Um, and so to me, that has become a conversation grabber because the past uh, election cycle, there hasn't been anybody with any ties, let alone political ties, in Tallahassee. And that has been the congressman's greatest strength um, is, 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 is holding on to that base in Tallahassee and the surrounding area. <laughs> You ain't too much um, in the surrounding. <laughs> really? Okay, let me let me stop to tell you why why Darren is laughing because you guys can't see it. But if what Ciotis has done, Ciotis, if you say something, it'll flip over to your camera. Please watch Ciotis's background, everybody. <laughs> Can you say something? Explain yeah, what you got going on here. Yeah. So um, yeah, just to let so the, that way the camera can stay on me. But yeah, I, I switched my uh, my background. <laughs> that way it can be a little entertaining with um with <laughs> this this video <laughs> that <be> cool. <laughs> all i can say so let me for those of you who haven't seen it and who can't see it uh cardi b has this now famous song which i actually worked out to i did my workout in the backyard you guys know how i'm about fitness i worked out in the backyard uh, before i went for a run and cardi has this song coronavirus coronavirus <laughs> and so <laughs> there is a a video of her taunting uh, the president, and uh, it's pretty funny. So, uh, right, no, no, it's quite funny, quite funny. Thank, I, I, um, he was laughing. I wanted people to know what he because I could see it. They, that, there you go. Yeah, that was hilarious. That yeah, But yeah. yeah, so back to my point. So not having anybody with any pretty much credible or just ties in general with Tallahassee base. Um, has been very interesting, and I think that you know that's a strategy on his side of uh, Dr. Chester, which may work in his favor, that may not. Um, only the voters will decide in August, but I think that um, is very interesting because Dr. Chester, he's local. Uh, his mom worked in the Duval County School Board for 40 years. Um, his dad has worked in previous mayor's administration. Um, so their ties in Jacksonville is strong as well as, as his mom was Miss FAMU. His dad won the championship for uh, FAMU first uh, championship, I believe, as the starting quarterback. Um, he was a uh, football player at FAMU. They're both in the same fraternity. So it, 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 it's very interesting. The, the greatest power. fraternity in the land, by the way, Cap Alpha Cypher. I was gonna let you go there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, um, and, and you know, here's the other thing too, just on his own right, um, Al was a former professional football player, um, Dr. Chester. As, yeah, as well as he opened, um, and this is just, I know personally, opened the Newtown Pharmacy and would literally go around um, before he even thought about running for Congress and take medicine to people who couldn't afford it as a pharmacist. And he opened a pharmacy school uh, that's still running in the community. So on his own right, I think he, you know, has accomplished some, some things. And LJ uh, was a former congressional staffer, yeah. right, for Congresswoman Carrie Meek. So we're talking about an interesting race that could, it's going to be one to watch. Any others that we should be looking as we begin to wrap things up? Because I know people are probably sick of seeing us, and we do want to give some updates about the you know situation before we go. Any others we should be looking at? Uh, definitely congressional uh, four with uh, Congressman Rutherford and challenger uh, Donna Deegan. Yeah, former, formerly uh, Donna Deegan was a former news anchor, one of my colleagues who I know uh, really well. And after she retired, um, and during her there, she was uh, uh, Donna Run, breast cancer run. She's a breast cancer survivor, so she had a breast cancer run. She's a news anchor as well. Uh, she was one of the surrogates for the Democratic gubernatorial nominee, Andrew Gillum, during his campaign for governor. Powerful surrogate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's going to be a race. Well, that is a race to watch as well. Um, you know, if you look at previous numbers, there hasn't been a Democrat credible to her um, in as well. Uh, someone who has name recognition um, that's approachable, that has black ability, um, but also has the resources and funds as well. I mean, we all three know that that's the very key point in running any campaign, especially challenging in a very well-known and respected incumbent. So, um, but I really do respect the ground game that she has built. I mean, there is this is definitely a coalition of of the people in that lives in that di district. So I'm excited to see that race. Pretty impressive. Seattle, any races we should be keeping our eye on as time uh, gets closer, because we don't even know how the election's gonna happen. We may be doing the elections via Zoom. I mean, who knows at this point? But any things we should be keeping our eye on coming up? Uh, I mean, you know, in, you know, um, me being so political, every race is a race to watch. But, uh, you know, as you guys mentioned, Darren, uh, that Congressional District 5 race is definitely one that's gonna be, that's gonna be um, where people in Northeast Florida are gonna uh, be watching that one. Um, you know, you have a, a sitting um, congressman right now, and you have a crisis, a community crisis, um, a world crisis. So how he handles himself during this time um, will reflect um, in those results. Um, you know, at, you know, some people are starting to express themselves. You know, you can't be absent during this time. Um, and then, especially when it becomes a, a known pattern. So. Um, it's going to be, that's going to be an interesting race. Then, of course, the, uh, the, the congressional seat four for the state of Florida, um, you know, Donald Deacon, um, you know, that is somebody I'll just, just put it out there. I'm, I'm supporting. Yeah. Um, I have a very long relationship with uh, the incumbent. Um, however, I, you know, I, I think we do need a change. Because um, the rumor, I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. I'm going to drop the political rumor and maybe it was right, wrong or indifferent. But what I heard through the political grapevine was that some people were whispering, trying to urge the mayor to get in the race and saying that maybe Representative Rutherford would retire. This is just political punditry that I'm, I heard in Scuttlebutt in the street. Uh, mm -hmm. They were urging the mayor to leave the race or to, to leave the mayor's office and thinking that uh, Representative Rutherford would retire and thinking that Donna Deegan was that credible of a challenge that they needed someone with the heft of a Lenny Curry, who's a former state Republican Party chair. Had you yeah. guys heard that? Yeah, so I had heard that rumor, you know, rumors like that have a lot of um, validity to it because they ran a poll. Um, so we do know a poll was ran um, and, you know, they threw a poll on him for that race, on the mayor for that race. Correct. Correct. So, you know, you know that it was, a, you know, options, you know, and according to the polling, um, you know, they haven't released all the results. But, you know, we know she, Donna Deacon, did a very good job maintaining, especially in a district like that, you know, where it's not supposed to be in her favor. So 
Um, I'm excited to see the results from that one. You know, I, it's, you know, I'm gonna do my part to, to help where I can. Um, but yeah, that's a good one. And also the last one um, before we wrap up is a state house district 14. Um, you have incumbent um, state representative Kimberly Daniels, yeah. um, uh, first challenger uh, Cornell Crooms, who is also a former candidate for city council. Um, and you have a uh, state uh, candidate Angela Nixon. Nixon, um, she's um, you know the uh, former Democratic Party, Duval Democratic Party vice chair. Oh, is um, she not? that's news to me. She's she resigned. She's no longer vice chair. Uh, leave. Uh, uh, she took a leave uh, while she go through this process. So that's why I said former. Our, our oh, only leave. She, say that. She's but, the Demo She's oh, the party gosh. vice chair. Darren, you're former vice chair of the party, and you did it when you ran, I think. Right? Do we still? Isn't that? I will resign. You, you resign completely. After me, but she's just on leave. Okay, right. so we're gonna still call her the vice chair of the party. I guess. She's still the vice chair on leave. But, <laughs> you, know, but, you know, I didn't want this to be a commercial later on. You know, somebody may. <laughs> yeah, I was in line. I got <laughs> it. But yeah, so let's so talk about that very quickly. That race, and by the way, guys, we're gonna we're about to wrap this up. If you have comments or questions, please join the experience very quickly. Um, we will always. I'm available all the time. You can find me on Twitter at Rockman J. Uh, here on Facebook at Rockman J Fans, Facebook.com Rockman J Fans, my favorite social media of choice, Instagram at Rockman J. And, uh, or you can drop some comments here so that either Ciatis or Darren can answer those questions. By the way, while we're here, I wanted to thank Khadijah for making sure that we had Three's company's number. I will put that in the comments or when we load this. But that number is area code 904 374 0917. That's 904 374 0917. That's the number for Three's Company Paper Products. They do have the toilet paper that everybody is so desperately looking for. Uh, they can help you out. So we'll make sure we leave that information. Thank you so much, Khadija, for uh, providing it. And uh, Imani just asked a question before we get back in. Where can I read all about these political figures? Like you said, uh, Ciatis, this is not a commercial. This is my show. But there is one place, FloridaPolitics.com, that is a really great clearinghouse, um, Imani, that talks about politics from down your way. Imani's looking at the show right now from Orlando and your congresswoman, um, the rumor and scuttlebutt congresswoman, uh, who is from Jacksonville, Florida, Duval, uh, Val <laughs> Demings. Yeah. <laughs> my, dear, my dear friend and Wolfpack graduate, uh, Val Demings, is being talked about as a possible running mate for, um, uh, Vice President Biden, should he secure the nomination? So you can find out about all of that stuff, floridapolitics.com. Uh, great, great resource um, to, to be able to look in and understand what is happening politically around the state of Florida. So thanks for that information. I know you wanted to add something else. Let's uh, start to wrap this thing up. I know we've been talking for about an hour. Um, before we go, though, I want to say right now this news is just in. Uh, New York City is leading uh, with coronavirus deaths. They have reached over 1,300 deaths by coronavirus. Um, the United States as a whole, um, including those people that we talked about here earlier, 4,700. The numbers are past 4,700. We're getting the toll in because some places aren't reporting yet, but we are over 4,700 when it comes to deaths in the United States. And there's some who are saying that we could have as much as 100,000. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying it to remind you to be cautious and be careful. Right now, the global number of cases of the coronavirus is at 967,000, which means we're close to a million cases of the coronavirus and uh, the worldwide numbers of deaths are still coming in. Uh, before we get right back to the end of the program, I'm reminded, which I've got to post, uh, I don't know if you guys guys have seen it, but my favorite, there's, there's a, a guy who says something that we may not all, not all get to say in public, but he says what we want to say, and that guy is Samuel L. Jackson. Did you guys see the post he did about uh, the book he read? No. I'm going to post it. It says, stay the mm at home. There's no one who can say the MF word like Samuel L. Jackson. And if he tells you, MF, stay the F at home, I believe that Samuel L. Jackson uh, may get through to some people that are still trying to have black parties and do all that kind of stuff. So 
we got to, you know, use our resources. Any final thoughts or comments uh, you guys want to make as we wrap this thing up? Absolutely, because I am definitely getting hit on to this, to talk about the uh, local uh, executive order from Mayor Curry um, about what does that look like. Um, a lot of business owners are concerned. Um, so is this a official lockdown or is this just uh, some uh, limitations that's been set out? So I know me and Sal, we talked about this before offline, but I, I don't want us to leave before we address that conversation. And can I tell you too, Darren, it's funny. I used the term on my initial post on Facebook earlier when the news came out. And I usually have a lot of my posting automated, but I thought this was significant enough to go on. So I put... Fine, it's final. I mean, it's official. Lockdown. I got emails, direct messages, text messages, phone calls about it's not a lockdown. This is not a lockdown. And so I guess we just need more clarification. I think you all said it best in the beginning. Communication is essential. Yeah, and, and, uh, and to, to kind of answer it, and, and you, know, you guys know that's part of the reason I went alive today because of the number of questions. Um, but I agree that this is, uh, people watch a lot of TV. So when they're here in lockdown, um, even, you know, you look at the executive order that is in um, Orlando or the one that's in New York, um, you, you know, they have, they, it's the same thing. They can go to the store if they want to, you know, if they wanted to or if they needed to. Um, however, a lot of stores have shut down because, they, they're just everybody's trying to limit places where people can go even for essential items so we're not there yet but right now we're just in a predicament where we're asking people if you don't have to go anywhere stay in the house stay within your the confinement of it um this executive order that was issued today by the both the mayor of duval county and the governor it also these orders were technically already in place but it added the teeth to it that would allow arresting, fine, and regulated powers by the different um, law enforcement agencies. It's still just so vague, though. Like, yeah, and I agree with you. Yeah, I, I, who gets arrested? Who gets fined? Who gets? Yeah, it's I, so I, I, I totally agree because one of the questions that you know, you guys know, I get my hair cut every week. I love getting a haircut, but which you, you know, can't do now. <laughs> yeah, can't do now. Yeah. You know, we can add that in there. So there were a lot of, uh, you know, question marks that should have been addressed in there. And I think we, sh we, we could have done a better job with, um, in, you know, deciding which businesses are essential and which one are non-essential. Um, and, you know, how do we come up with it? You know, you can say a construction worker that's just working on a house, that's not an essential. Well, the governor said that now um, any you know, those type of positions are essential now. So gotcha. it's one of those interesting things. Well, we do know that there is so much to talk about. I appreciate you guys for taking a few moments to discuss it with me. Obviously, you know you got to come back because we don't even know how this election thing is going to happen, what's going to happen, where it's going to happen. But one thing we know for sure is that Florida will be strong. Florida will survive and Florida will move forward. So before I end the show, I want to say thank you to um, our forever, my forever true blue Trojan brother, Seattis Jackson, who is all about Reebok Senior High School. Thank you for being here on this show with us and for doing what you do politically in the community. No problem, no problem. Thank you for having me, Rodney. And Darren, uh, former vice chair of the Democratic Party of Duval County, uh, and Anna, one of those rattlers. Did I, did I do it right there? That's Rattler thing. Go we'll work on it. <laughs> I need to work on it. Thank you so much, man, for being a part of the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having a very important conversation. Absolutely. For all of you that were watching tonight, it is very important that we remember those people who have passed on. Uh, it's important, though, that we have focus, that we stay focused, and not to allow ourselves to be sidetracked or moved away simply because a worldwide pandemic has thrown our focus off. Um, for me, meditation is something that I do in my home and even in my office on a regular basis. It's something I share with my students and it's the way I start my day and end my day. I believe in prayer because I believe that is the time when I speak to God. So I do pray, and read the scriptures and hold texts, but meditation, that's where God has the space to speak to me. And if we're in that space of silence, 
and understanding, then nothing can bother us and we are fearless. So I hope that you can live the rest of at least this pandemic and hopefully your life in understanding and fearlessness because together through information, but certainly through connection, we will win. Thanks for tuning in to the experience. I'll see you next time. Yo, am I Yagi? Yes, G I A N T. She boy, you already know what time it is, man. <laughs> ah! Let me hear them birds call them. Listen. <clears throat> It's the Rotman experience. The Rotman experience. The knowledge that he dropping most is missing make you curious. And we can't mess this up cause you know he gon' be furious. He bring the news to you cause it's the truth, ain't no stopping it. Say you didn't know, well here's the proof coming from Rotman Johnson. Ain't no straight out of Compton. Duval County with that weight that we rockin'. Now you tuned in to the Rotman experience. <laughs>